All righty, I think we'll get things kicked off now. Um, so let's get going. Uh, today, uh, um, we're going to talk about the lead and copper rule revisions. I'm uh, going to do an overview of what the program is and, uh, you know, finish up by talking about the opportunities that it's going to have for us as a company moving forward in the next few years, because this is going to be an ongoing um, an ongoing exercise for quite a period of time. Um, for those of you who don't know me, most of you do, but you know, my name's Ed Overberger. I'm one of the assistant vice presidents here and work in the business development group um, with the, uh, the BD bunch. So, uh, and many of you may not know this, but uh, uh, I've been a township supervisor for more than 25 years. I'm currently chairman. Uh, and I oversee our public works department, which is all of four people. Uh, I'm also the first vice president of Burst County Association of Township Officials. Uh, and I say all that because this is the same presentation I'm gonna be giving out at the PSATS conference uh, in Hershey that's coming up this weekend. Uh, and that's where we're gonna have statewide, uh, all of the second class township uh, supervisors are invited to attend that. Uh, the attendance typically is between 4,000 and 5,000 people. So it's uh, a big event. It's our biggest uh, uh, conference of the year that we're involved with. So looking forward to seeing a bunch of you out there and also hopefully a lot of our clients. So again, the objective today is, is you know, you guys are kind of know about what the uh, uh, service line inventory is, um, you know, kind of understand the impact on the local communities, uh, and and also be able to understand how we can move forward as a as a company with this. And there we go, background. So the lead and copper rule revisions uh, were first published in the revisions. Now were published in 2021. Uh, the originals were were published in 2001. And basically, what it is is it's the as it says there, they want to get the lead out. So there's really two pieces to this new initiative, uh, which is really taking place because of what happened in Flint, Michigan, uh, where they want to, um, you know, state not only nationally, but, you know, here for Pennsylvania statewide is to identify all of the service lines that may or may not be led. Uh, so this is a two-step process. Step one is they want to have inventories uh, done, uh, which will, um, identify those service lines, and then phase two to this, which will be after October 16th, 2024, uh, will be replacement of the lead uh, service lines. Um, oh, moving forward. Oh, and, and again, other aspects of regulation that, that there's gonna be the lead and copper rule improvements, that's the LCRI. And that's the one where the regulations are gonna kick in that's gonna force everybody to replace their lead lines. Uh, again, this inventory is due on October 16th of 2024. All public water service providers are gonna be required to submit this inventory um, and submit it using, uh, uh, there's some specificity in terms of what DEP is looking for in terms of the report. We'll get into that a little bit. So who's affected by these copper rule revisions? Well, obviously all community water systems. So it's public authorities and privately owned authorities. Hence, you know, if a, uh, a such as a mobile home park uh, that is, you know, pulling well water and treating their own well, that currently have log four requirements, uh, they all fall under this. Also, it's a lot of people forget is a non-transient community water systems. And again, those systems are schools, factories, industrial parks, office buildings, hospitals, et cetera. Um, so it, it's a little bit more than just the service lines only for uh, residential and or commercial applications. Uh, again, you're looking at 160,000 service lines uh, from 1,902 community systems and another thousand non-transit community systems that all need to be surveyed. Uh, there is some funding available that will become available for this in terms of the inventory process right now. There's not uh, direct funding, uh, but as we move forward as a result of the uh, infrastructure bill, that money is going to be flowing through PenVest. For those of you that are familiar with how PenVest works, 
Uh, typically, that's a loan program. This will be a 100% grant program, but it's going to operate under the PennVest uh, typical operating guidelines where all of your inventory is going to have to be done. All of your uh, 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 engineering and, and bidding documents are going to have to be in place prior to PennVest uh, granting a grant. Uh, but then that money that the that the public uh, water services provided will be reimbursed for the upfront money that was needed to get there. So the service line inventory, um, you know, is meant to you know track progress uh, toward lead service line replacement if it's needed. Uh, this is also going to include a, a requirement for uh, communicating with the public. So this is going to provide a basis for that communication. Uh, in, in terms of mailings, uh, posting on a website, it is dependent on, on the uh, population density and user density. Um, and then also verification uh, on TAP uh, monitoring samples are being collected from homes, service lines uh, that do are, that, that are uh, um, determined to be led. Uh, they're going to require to be monitored until they're replaced. So when we talk about a service line, what is that? Uh, can you see my cursor on screen? Yes. 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 Oh, great. Thank you. So, you know, here's your water main. And, you know, for us, that's typically, you know, what we're working with with our clients is the water main, uh, the, the, the uh, connector or gooseneck, as it's often called, uh, which then comes down to what's called the curb stop. And the curb stop is the split, if you will, between the, the uh, system-owned service line and then the private-owned service line. And what we're going to find as we move forward through here is the inventories are going to require, I don't know why that keeps disappearing, the uh, service lines are going to be required to be identified in front of that curb stop and after the curb stop. So there's four categories, bottom line, that everybody's going to have to get to. And that is, is it a lead pipe? Is it a galvanized pipe requiring replacement? Is it determined to be non-lead? Or is the lead status unknown? And again, you know, for today's presentation, I'm not going to get into some of the specifics of that. And I'll show you a few examples of, of, of this, but we're not going to get into a lot of the nitty-gritty details of it. But you know, for example, here's a situation where it's been determined that this is all copper pipe uh, from the gooseneck all the way to the home. Now, the gooseneck might be lead, which is very common because it's malleable, and, and that's how those connections are made quite often. But that's considered a non-lead pipe. A galvanized requiring replacement, and that's the biggest one that we get questions about. Um, and here's a situation where you've got a lead gooseneck. You've got a copper pipe to the curb stop, and then it's galvanized pipe after that. This would be considered uh, a lead uh, system, but they call it galvanized requiring replacement. And that is because this gooseneck is lead. If this was copper pipe all the way, that's okay, believe it or not. But the issue at hand is, is galvanized captures lead and, 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 and again, I'm not the not the engineer here, but you know, holds that lead in the pipe. And even though you could eliminate this lead gooseneck into into a uh, into something else, the galvanized pipe could still continue to introduce lead into the drinking water. Uh, and to illustrate that, here's a copper connector at the street. You got galvanized pipe all the way. That's considered non-lead. Obviously, you got a lead gooseneck, galvanized pipe, lead pipe, that's going to be lead. And even though this, this is demonstrated, even though this copper pipe was replaced on the surface side, the fact that that may have been a lead pipe before and you have galvanized pipe downstream, that's also going to be considered galvanized requiring replacement. And then again, here's galvanized all the way without any gooseneck, and that's a non-lead. And then the last one we talked about was lead status unknown. Uh, that's where 
um, and you'll see how we're going to work this as I, I move through the presentation a little bit, that it was never able to be determined as to what this downstream, downstream pipe was. So that's going to be considered an unknown. So how do you determine what these service lines are? There's going to be a number of methodologies available for that. <clears throat> um, and there's a list here, as you can see, service line documentation. The way to approach the documentation is going to be sort of backwards. You're going to want to take a, 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 the, the public water supplier, the PWS as it's called. Uh, you're going to want to first determine which of those definitely are not lead. That's going to be the first task as, as any provider starts to uh, try to meet the documentation that DEP is requiring. So as you can see, it's through a review of a lot of the paperwork that hopefully, hopefully they have. And again, they got to determine this in front of and after the curve stop. Uh, taking a look at existing GIS map information for those communities that, that have been working with it. Uh, if you have a, a, a development um, that's been, you know, built since 1991, you know that that's not going to have lead service. And having said that, um, you know, here you'll see that Pennsylvania outlawed lead pipe in 1991. So pretty much any service that's been installed after that, and you can confirm this either through uh, building permit records uh, and, or, and or deed searches, um, that the construction took place since 1991. That's all you need to know. That is a non-lead non uh, location. But again, here's kind of a, you know, you can go through this flow. If it was built after 91, lead service lines are not a concern. Uh, if it was done before that, we start to focus on properties constructed prior to the date installation stopped, et cetera. Again, I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty of, of what needs to be done here. But, um, you know, throughout this whole process, you know, the activities, you want to focus on activities where the service lines uh, less than two inches in diameter are involved. More than more than two inches in diameter are most likely not lead. And that's going to be uh, evident by the information that you're able to glean. So if through written documentation, you cannot determine uh, whether or not you have lead lines, uh, the PWS is going to be required to physically search. Uh, you televising may work depending upon what kind of curb stop or meters you have, uh, but most likely you're going to be looking to actually excavate. And this is showing where at the curb stop, uh, there's going to need to be excavation, uh, not less than 18 inches from either side of the curb stop. And there needs to be another point of the longer section down here, either outside or inside the home that confirms that that pipe that's coming into the building is consistent with what you, you found out here. And again, that's physically dig with the backhoe or using um, um, uh, uh, hydro excavation, which is what they're doing here. So, Basically, the, 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 you know, how the PWS is going to have to go after this is looking at preliminary records review, community records like building permits, meter installations, property tax records, uh, visual examination, customer survey, utility staff meter inspection, uh, field verifications then. Potentially, you could use uh, uh, camera inspections and then, you know, targeted service line sampling where you're actually getting in there and scraping scraping a sample off. Uh, and then last but not least is mechanical or the hydro vac. So if you haven't caught on yet, what's happening here is that the responsibility of the public water system uh, or public water provider uh, is going to need to 
enter, potentially enter private property in order to determine whether or not the far side of the curb stop is indeed lead or non-lead uh, or undetermined, uh, which is ob obviously going to lead to a little bit of angst. Uh, this is kind of the context by which out at the PSATS conference with the township supervisors, we're talking to them about this because uh, they don't know, you know, the elected officials don't know this is coming. You know, the, you know, all of the, pretty much all of the authorities and water services out there know it's coming. Um, you know, but what's going to happen is, is this starts, I think, to rear its head a little bit. Uh, it's going to be the, the public official that's going to be hearing it from their constituents about what the heck is this you want to enter onto my property. And I'm going to come back and touch on that a little bit. So on the service line inventory reporting, when we get when we get down to the document DEP is looking for, um, uh, there's three required reporting sections. There's the general information, which is what we just kind of covered, uh, you know, where you're you're taking it from all of these various documents you have. Uh, there's inventory methodologies, and then the detailed inventory is the final document that's going to go. Uh, to DEP. And that detailed inventory is going to talk about how did you use general information? What inventory method was used in order to come up with that detailed inventory for them? So the actual reporting itself, uh, and this is where the opportunity for Arrow is going to come up. Uh, I mean, not only do we have an opportunity to support our clients potentially in, in an administrative way to help them put the uh, inventory together, uh, but now it comes to, to the reporting of that. Um, DEP does have an Excel spreadsheet uh, that can be used that the outputs from that spreadsheet uh, meet all the requirements that DEP has. Uh, it's, it's a fairly easy spreadsheet to use, but when you have somebody that's got, you know, two, 3,000 services or even 600 services where you got to put in each, each uh, property one at a time, you can see that the task can look pretty daunting. Um, what we're in the process of doing with Origins Group, Andrew's Group, is looking at building this into a GIS uh, uh, model uh, platform. And we'll get a little bit of that next week when he gives his presentation about what they're doing to develop that. Um, but the key is it it's, has all of the output information that DEP is going to require, which, by the way, is coming from the EPA. I mean, this is an unfunded mandate that's coming down all the way through to a certain extent. Um, it needs to be formatted to satisfy public accessibility. All of these records are going to be open to the public. So if you want to know if your neighbor's got lead copper or, or, or uh, lead lines or not or copper lines, you're going to be able to look that up if you want to. So again, inventory reporting using GIS, one of the nice things about using the GIS and, and, and what uh, we're gonna be putting together for our clients and others is the fact that, you know, a lot of communities already have GIS data where their, their water system is already documented. Uh, the way we're gonna be setting this up is that we're gonna be able to customize uh, to meet whatever uh, GIS format, if you will, that all the individual communities are going to have. And I'm sure Andrew's biting his lip right now because I'm using all the wrong terminology, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, basically it's going to be a more simplified process. You know, rather than having to fill in a big long spreadsheet, there is going to be a list of questions here that will have a drop down list. And it's either, a, you know, you either can answer it or you, or you can't. Um, the other thing that's neat about it is, you know, the fact that, you know, with GIS, you can download all of the uh, properties that are listed at the county level, you know, right down to the local municipality, uh, you know, such as the situation as you see here. Um, again, easy data entry, and it can be it can be customized to the community and to the what information they already have and, and what output they want. But then this kind of illustrates what a final report would look like, where that layer within the GIS system would have an open report, you know, show you where it is, et cetera, and then can 
can come up and tell you how uh, it was sampled, what was the system basis, the classification, et cetera. All that information on a per property basis will be available. So to sum this up, uh, all community and non-transient community water systems are going to need to step one, develop this service line inventory. Um, all water systems are going to need to review historical records that identify service line material to prepare the inventory. And that could be where the authority is going to have to work with the township or the, the privates are going to have to work with the township probably to, to get some of the information they need in order to satisfy the inventory requirements. Uh, each service, and we'll get to that, you know, needs to be classified as one of four different classifications. And all systems will need to track and identify service line materials uh, as they are encountered, encountered you know, moving forward. So again, this is due by October 16th, 2024. Uh, these are the four categories that every service line in front of and after the curb stops are gonna to need to be identified. It's either gonna be lead, galvanized requiring replacement, non-lead, and lead status unknown. And I will tell you already, DEP has already hinted, if a community sends in and you got 50% of your service lines or lead status unknown, you are going to be targeted when it comes time for replacement. And I just wanted to point out, this is our lead and copper squad here at Arrow. Uh, I think uh, you recognize everybody here, but this is pretty much our uh, our water and, and BD team that's on the, on the front end of all this. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, pretty much it. Uh, you know, just to, to, you know, kind of finalize here, I think one of the rubs we're gonna see is this whole private property issue. Um, I'm sure there's going to be, as we look forward, a point in time where there's going to be people that have not determined whether they have lead line or not, you know, whether it's five or 10 years down the road. Uh, my personal opinion is at some point in the future, um, if you want to sell your home, uh, much like Radon, for those of you who are familiar with that today, uh, I don't think a bank is going to lend a mortgage unless it's determined that you do not have lead service lines. Uh, so, you know, the messaging that that our our clients are going to be needing to give to their constituents is, you know, money is going to become available uh, for this replacement. Uh, that's part of the infrastructure bill. That's all going to be funneled through PenVest. And uh, if you don't, as a homeowner, uh, it's possible that the the PWS will replace from from the street all the way to the house. And that's all going to get paid for through that infrastructure money. So if somebody, if a homeowner, um, uh, you know, doesn't jump on board with this, they're going to lose that ability to have somebody else pay for their their uh, lead line replacement. 